Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar with United Electric Controls. My name is Callum O'Reilly and I'm the Senior Editor of Tanks and Terminals. The title of today's presentation is Wireless Heart Gas Detection, a proven way to enhance plant safety. And our speakers are Chris Frail, who is Global Product Manager for Wireless Gas Detectors, and Ken Kirkwood, who is the Vice President of Sales at United Electric Controls. Now in this webinar, Chris and Ken will discuss the evolution of wireless technology in process control applications, examine what barriers have restrained its usage in safety applications, and explore how the technology has changed, making its acceptance grow in recent years. Following the presentation, there will be an opportunity to put your questions to Chris and Ken in a live Q&A session. So we'd like to invite you to submit your questions throughout the course of today's presentation. For those of you that are joining us on a mobile, you can access the question box by simply tapping the icon at the bottom of your screen. And for those of you that are using a desktop or a laptop, just click on the orange arrow on the right of your screen to open up the user interface and reveal the question box. Now, before we get started, I also want to let you know that everyone who is registered to attend this webinar will be emailed a full recording after today's session. So you can easily recap and watch the presentations again. So I'll now hand you over to Chris and Ken for their presentation. Hello, thank you for joining us today for our webinar on wireless gas detection. My name is Ken Kirkwood. I'm Vice President of Sales for United Electric Controls. And my colleague here will introduce himself. Yeah, thank you, Ken. My name is Chris Frail. I'm the uh, Global Product Manager for the wireless gas detectors that we're going to talk a little bit about today. Uh, we are going to talk a bit about uh, kind of the market shifts over the last several years around gas detection and how wireless gas detectors play in that. And what we want to do is tie that back to actual user cases to give you some context on, on how to apply these. As a quick overview of our agenda here, uh, we'll talk about a little bit of those market pressures um, and the kind of the case for wireless gas detection. Uh, but we want to spend most of our time talking a little bit on how customers are using uh, wireless gas detection today uh, to improve their gas detection coverage uh, very quickly and reliably. And, um, and, and then we'd want to open up for a little bit more of a discussion. So uh, over the last few years, we've seen some accelerating change in uh, markets that require gas detection for uh, toxic gases as well as combustibles. A lot of this has been enabled through a lot of new technologies. Uh, but what's driving it uh, historically was regulatory changes, uh, as we're aware of with the methane and CO2 uh, initiatives a lot in the oil and gas, especially in the upstream uh, space. Uh, but we're also seeing increased enforcement of existing safety regulations uh, to protect people and plant uh, from explosions or explosions, exposures to those. More recently, uh, some disruptive uh, aspects uh, that we've seen is around COVID, where we've seen an upset in the oil and gas segment, where there was a significant decrease in demand uh, and now a quick increase. Uh, but also with the uh, war going on uh, actively, com countries are looking for alternative sources for the energy uh, needs that they've had and others are looking at the opportunities that opened up with um, uh, gas from Russia both resulting in infrastructure investment uh, that would require new gas detection. Everything is moving very rapidly, uh, so deployment uh, and needs for those safety measures uh, are coming quicker and often quicker than what you could respond with a full NRE and development of a wired system. Companies are also looking at uh, trying to move more and more towards automation, partly because of the availability of knowledgeable uh, individuals and workforce uh, as the workforce is aging, uh, partly also for safety measures, fewer people in the field means fewer people at risk of exposure, 
uh, and also because of reducing budgets. They don't want to hire as much as many people. They want to maximize profits. So a lot of these policies are, are looking for much more data uh, and deployment of information. They can't have folks walking around making measurements all the time. Uh, much rather have uh, several transmitters in their place uh, doing those same types of measurement. And we're seeing this fairly um, heavy in the oil and gas segment. Uh, and, and where we spent a lot of time is in kind of the tanks and terminals where existing infrastructure might be aging, uh, might be exposed to marine environments where they need to be uh, updated, replaced often. It's impacting uh, conduit and, and wires. Uh, and then also the mining industry, uh, both uh, surface and, and underground mining operations, especially in copper. Uh, where we're seeing in uh, South America the demand for copper has skyrocketed with uh, the increasing need for electronics and electrical equipment driven a lot by uh, the electric uh, car industry. So there's a variety of things driving the market space all looking to shift quickly where uh, uh, operations may have been more steady about 10 years ago uh, having to change over operations to do new things and the existing designed in uh, fire and gas systems may no longer be sufficient or they're seeking to add more points of data in there to make better decisions. So all of these dynamics where uh, customers need to move quickly, uh, they want more data to feed their uh, AI systems, make better decisions, automate, um, is driving customers to look for alternative solutions to the traditional way of putting in a wire detector. And so customers are looking to increase that coverage in a fast and scalable way. And where operations are changing over uh, and they're modifying, especially if you think about mining industry, everything's constantly changing. Um, they want to be able to move that equipment around as needed as they mothball units, as they ramp up units, they might want to look to uh, monitor locations that have traditional blind spots um, and uh, or they don't want to send folks in with a handheld detector. Uh, they want that flexibility. The nice thing about wireless is it's very easy to scale up. Uh, you don't have to trench or get permits for wiring. Uh, the NRE cost is significantly less because you don't have to figure out how to route all that heavy metal. Um, and uh, because of that also, you can really uh, deploy that very quickly. More and more as, as these wireless networks are going up in plants, they're more accustomed to the security and reliability also that that comes with. Uh, there's self-healing networks, there's several vendors, if, especially if you take a uh, open standard like Wireless Heart or ISA 100. And uh, the technologies have shifted to the point where uh, instead of every day having to charge a battery or every six months, a lot, a lot of these newer gas detectors can operate for multiple years uh, without much concern beyond the occasional bump test that you would want to perform to make sure the sensor is operating just like any wire detector would. And finally, when we think about how we apply wireless technologies or wireless gas detector in a system that's traditionally been um, part of the safety system uh, uh, in, in terms of responding to an incident and shutting it down, uh, this technology, the wireless technology right now does not have clear protocols uh, for a SIL system. So when we look at applying it uh, in regards of it, uh, expanding on NF NFPA 72, uh, there was a couple guidances put out and the, and the spec numbers are listed here for your reference. Um, really in terms of a wireless system, we want to be able to put it in terms of an operator intervention or alarming level, uh, hopefully as an earlier alarm than what a traditional system. And the way that does it is by providing multiple more points and getting better coverage, it fills in a lot of the gaps that may be left by a traditional system. Um, and 
if you're able to detect the gases sooner or at a lower level of uh, gas present, you can respond before the incident occurs where you have a full leak that's large enough to find an ignition source and cause an explosion. Uh, and so a lot of the customers are doing this has started out by augmenting existing wired systems and now we're starting to see the benefits and the robustness of now starting moving on to a wireless system instead of a wired because of the ease of uh, deployment. So I'm going to hand this over to Ken. He's going to talk through some of the use cases that will give you a little bit more background on how to apply these, uh, where they've been successful, and give you a little bit of insight on in what some of the end users uh, use to consider using wireless gas detectors. Ken? Thanks, Chris. Appreciate this opportunity to chat with everybody this afternoon. Uh, I was going to talk about four or five uh, different uh, use cases for the wireless gas detector. Um, not go into any of them in any real detail, but uh, to give you a kind of an overview of what uh, what customers have been doing with the uh, the product since we uh, since we introduced it, um, and you'll see some common themes throughout some of these, which I'll I'll highlight as well. But if you uh, if you want to talk about any of these in detail, uh, we can certainly do that after the webinar, or uh, you can contact me separately, and I would be happy to chat with them, chat with you about them um, as much as you'd like. So uh, the first use case that we'd look at here is uh, on floating roof tanks, which obviously with the roof moving up and down uh, gives us a challenge or gives normal wired gas detection a challenge, I should say, and probably less of one for wireless. Um, and the customer was dealing with the fact that regulations were changing. The uh, regulations had gone from allowing people to be up on the roof of a tank or inside the, the uh, partially empty tank um, with just a portable gas detector on. Uh, and that is not particularly safe if you do have a, have a uh, problem up there with the gas leak or there's um, an issue, uh, that person is kind of stuck in there with it. So they wanted to have some continuous monitoring. And so they uh, put a gas detector on the roof of the tank, wireless, and then a repeater at the edge of the tank at the top, which would take the signal from the gas detector which is floating up and down and uh, beam it down to the gateway. Uh, very quick, uh, easy to install, uh, so you can get these up and running in a matter of hours instead of days or weeks if you were going to try to run wiring out to tanks. Um, so it was a quick solution that gave them the ability to bring a increased level of safety for their customers that, uh, that they hadn't been able to do previously and also to monitor the top of the tank to see if, uh, if there was any issues uh, coming up that they had to deal with. Okay, so the second uh, case is at uh, remote fuel terminals. And this is kind of a, an interesting case because they're using uh, vapor recovery units at these terminals. And they also have the loading and unloading of uh, gasoline. Um, and so they needed a way to be able to uh, monitor the site, which was frequently unmanned, for any kind of a leak around the vapor recovery unit or around the uh, fueling stations. Um, because it's unmanned, if there is a, an accident and, or if somebody does leak something, there's nobody there to check on it, and that was a concern for them. Uh, so that, that led to them looking at wireless as a possible solution, and they've implemented that in, in many of these terminals now um, fairly quickly. You know, obviously, you don't have to do any trenching. You don't have to shut down the terminals. Uh, your work is putting in the gateway and then hanging uh, gas detectors around the area, depending on what you're looking for. Um, an interesting note in this is that they're... Uh, in a way, they're using these as switches. Either there's hydrocarbons present or there isn't. And um, so the way that they use these, because we're looking at either propane or methane as the sensor, um, we're not getting a, um, I'm going to say, we're not getting an accurate reading of gasoline. We're getting presence of hydrocarbons or no presence. And they're using that as a way to say, okay, we've got, we've got something 
it's in the atmosphere, it shouldn't be there, and so we're going to go and um, send a maintenance person out there to find out what's going on. Uh, so again, the, uh, the ability to, to get these things up and running without disrupting their operation in any way, and yet bringing a higher level of safety and, uh, and assurance that things are, are running smoothly were, were the, uh, the reasons that, that this customer uh, has used quite a few of these things. Our third case is one in which a paint manufacturer had a series of solvent tanks on the other side of a railroad track and down a hill from the actual uh, blending site. Um, and the insurance uh, folks came in and asked them, why don't you have monitoring for leaks down in these solvent tanks? Um, and so they had, a, had an issue to deal with. How are they going to get wired gas detectors out across uh, a pretty wide expanse um, through some railroad, railroad tracks and out to the tanks. Um, and in the meantime, their insurance rate was going up because the insurance people noticed that, uh, that this was happening. Um, so they were unable to do trenching. They first looked at wired. That was going to be a problem for them. And um, very expensive and probably outweighing the cost of the insurance. Uh, so, but the alternative is not necessarily that good either, being unprotected. So they looked at wireless as a possible solution. Um, we did some testing with them out uh, in the area to to verify that this would uh, this would work for them. Um, so the diagram that you can see on the right is actually uh, the the mesh that they laid out. It's got three or four. Uh, gas detectors that are out in those solvent tanks up in the upper uh, left corner. Um, and then there are a couple of repeaters that actually bring that signal um, up the hill and across the railroad tracks uh, to some other gas detectors, which are then hooked into the gateway that's there. So this allows them to basically hop that signal up the hill um, without, uh, without a problem. Um, this was all installed within about a week um, after they decided to move ahead with it. Uh, very fast. This one, uh, they had no experience with wireless at all. So it involved putting in the gateway, um, hooking it up to their system so that they would get some information out of it the way they wanted to. Um, and uh, solving the problem, obviously, as quickly as possible so that there was uh, so that there were less uh, insurance uh, issues to deal with um, and also improving their safety. So the uh, the little insert there you can kind of see down at the bottom right um, shows the various gas detectors. One is in orange because we had pulled the battery from it to, to show that the, uh, the unit would alarm if the, if the battery was, uh, was dead or if the unit went dead. Um, but it gives you an idea of the way a mesh would work where you can see the, the green lines um, bouncing that signal back. The orange ones are less strong, so you've got a secondary path, but it's not quite as good as the primary, so it shows you kind of how you would get those signals back. Um, but it also illustrates that, uh, you know, that you can start off with no wireless and pretty quickly get something uh, up and running if you need to um, with a wireless system. Fourth of my uh, examples here is at a uh, large refinery here in uh, the U.S. Uh, at which they had just bought a small tank farm from an independent uh, operator that was nearby their refinery. Uh, and what they discovered when they went in was that there was no gas detection in that part of, uh, of, the, refi of the, the tank farm. Um, this obviously was a, was a big no-no for, uh, for the um, end user. Uh, they had policies in place uh, that uh, that this violated. Um, it also violated community standards. The community was not particularly happy uh, with the inspectors finding out that that there was no protection against leakage uh, and problems, accidents at this uh, at this little setup. So there were fines and uh, and some difficulties involved in the site. They began a project uh, that uh, they estimated when they started it that it was going to last them uh, six months. Um, they budgeted about $600, $625,000 to do the project because they were going to have to trench part of the way through a little bit of this site in order to get wiring to the, to the, around the bases of the tank. Um, and uh, they were looking at, uh, at, at 
throwing that off to an engineering company to get it done. So they were thinking six months, fines, and uh, being unprotected for that period of time um, in, a, in a significant way. And they saw that wireless, uh, they saw our wireless device and said, well, maybe that would work. Um, so we began to talk to them about that and ended up uh, pretty quickly uh, getting that specified into this site. Uh, they had within about three weeks after that, they had the entire system set up and running at the site. Um, it cost them a little bit over $100,000 to do. Uh, so they um, literally saved half a million dollars on this, uh, this project. But more importantly, they saved more than four months of time an effort to get it up and running, uh, so it made uh, it made the most of the problems go away very quickly. Uh, get rid of the fines, get rid of the insurance issues, get rid of the potential safety issues um, very fast, and that's really the key to a lot of these um, a lot of these stories that I can tell you about about this kind of device is it's the, the speed and the ability to uh, implement um, in a very flexible way. That, uh, that leads these customers to go down this path, start exploring this, and then start adopting it uh, as soon as they realize that it, that it really is, uh, is what it, what it um, purports to be. The last one I'd like to tell you about is actually one that, uh, that does not involve our product. Um, and it's this one here that I, I call the price of delay. And it was actually involved a joint venture in the Middle East. Uh, I was over there and talking with a, a senior engineer at one of the companies. Um, and at this joint venture, the one of the partners came in and audited the facility and uh, discovered that there was an insufficient number of gas detectors in the facility to protect it. Um, they um, were not happy with that, and they asked the joint venture to uh, to resolve that issue. Um, the joint venture then spent, uh, started a project for, it was going to last six to eight months, um, which it did. It required doing some trenching, um, which increased obviously some of the, the risks uh, of being on the site. In order to get these detectors installed, uh, but toward the end of the project, the, the partner came in, re-audited where they were, um, and the, the joint venture was pretty happy to say, oh yeah, we've got those detectors going in in the next couple of weeks and, uh, and that will solve the problem. And the auditors looked at them and said, wait a minute, you knew there was a gap here. You knew there was a safety issue. And what have you been doing to protect your people for the last six months? Um, at which point there was a lot of silence. And this engineer that was telling me this story uh, looked at me and said, I wish I'd known about your wireless before um, because they were kind of embarrassed at, uh, at where this had gone. So um, again, this is this, the delays that are involved in, in trying to get these things uh, resolved is really where wireless uh, shines because um, once you realize that you have a gap, once you realize that there may be an issue somewhere, then the clock is ticking and you have to realize that um, if something does go wrong in between that moment and um, when you finally decide to get it resolved, that's a period of time where you're kind of exposed. And if something does go wrong, um, it's it's kind of on you. So um, that's a that's a real significant advantage for using wireless. Um, I'm going to wrap up my side of things here and and just say that uh, there are dozens of these kinds of stories that I could tell you, and uh, you'd probably be bored out of your heads, but uh, it uh, it is um, kind of a common theme that runs through most of them that uh, that the flexibility and the speed of, of of installing and things like that are are uh, are the reasons that people are are looking at this kind of technology and adopting it. So I hope we've uh, we've shared some of this with you and and that you've gotten something from this today. Um, and we'll uh, we will wrap up. Well, we really thank you everybody for uh, joining us this afternoon. These are our contact details. If you'd like to reach out to us to uh, talk about any of the stuff that we've been talking about today, and I'll let uh, let Chris have the final word on it. Thanks again, Ken, for you know the overview of those applications. I I hope you guys have found some uh, uh, interesting pieces that may have uh, raised questions in your mind or spurred some ideas on how you could use wireless gas detectors. 
We want to take uh, some time now to open up for uh, questions or any sort of discussion or thoughts that you might have. Uh, feel free to uh, uh, indicate through the chat box or uh, ask the host uh, the question directly. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that, Chris and Ken. Uh, a really interesting presentation, and it's always fascinating to hear about some real-life use cases and discover how customers have been using your technology in particular. So thank you for sharing those with us today. Uh, we're now going to move on to the Q&A session. So if you have a question for Chris and Ken, now is the time to send it in to us. As a quick reminder, if you're using a mobile, you can access the question box by tapping the icon at the bottom of your screen. And for those of you that are using a desktop or a laptop, just click on the orange arrow on the right of your screen and that will open up a user interface and you can go ahead and type your question into the box. Um, I can see that we've had a few questions come in already. So um, Chris and Ken, we'll jump straight into them. Um, um, oh, and before we do that, actually, and also a reminder that we're, gonna, we're going to have um, we're going to have a survey at the end of this Q&A session. So I'll share some more details about that um, at the end of the webinar. But if you could all just stick around for, for a survey, that would be great. Um, so Chris, Ken, can you both hear me OK? No problems? Yeah, can hear you. No problem. OK, brilliant. All right, um, I, I'm, I'm going to kick off with um, a question that I have. So what is the transmission distance for these industrial wireless signals? And can the signal be transmitted and received over changes in elevation. Uh, so for example, from the ground level to the top of the tank roof. Do I take that one, Ken? Can you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so it's it's um, wireless heart actually operates um, on a 2.4 uh, gigahertz uh, spectrum. So it's it's very similar to any sort of network that would do that. Um, there's a couple of things that go into play is, is the gain antenna that you use as well as um, line of sight. So if you're in a situation where you have multiple elevations, you want to make sure that your antenna can actually have some vertical signal to it as well as some horizontal signal. And to do so, you want to have a lower gain antenna. So that's why when you're inside plants um, or you have multiple elevations, it's usually recommended that you use about a 2 GBI antenna uh so that you can get that vertical as well as um the horizontal signal um and then when you start getting into open fields you can go much longer distances so you can go over i'm going to get the numbers wrong about 700 uh is it 700 feet, um, about 700 feet. yeah so how many meters is that it's 250 feet. maybe yeah yeah sorry uh american based apologize um and uh and um you can get much longer distances with a higher gain antenna. Um, but when you do that, you're sacrificing your vertical. So when you have a uh, long distance on a flat plane, you can use directional antennas uh, or higher gain antennas to get those longer distances. Okay. I think if I could just add right in, in there that the, the, the whole purpose of uh, Yheart is to build a mesh. And in most plants, that means that you're you're running shorter distances versus longer because you have multiple devices that are all talking to each other. So, you know, occasionally you run into a situation where you have to get something pretty far away. But a lot of customers, what they're doing is is they're creating this mesh so that uh, so that they don't have to go quite as far with the signal. We've got um we've got a question that's coming that's asking whether the wireless detectors are covered by any standard. Yeah, so we, we mentioned this a little bit about proprietary versus open standards. And so Wireless Heart actually has a, uh, it's an open standard, uh, which is great because you can then um, qualify through third parties. Uh, we did so with Fieldcom, uh, it integrates more seamlessly. So if you follow the standard and work with the third parties and do their testing protocols, usually uh, it's a pretty seamless integration of a, a Wireless Heart to Wireless Heart gateway. Um, there's similar standards around ISA, uh, structured a little bit more differently uh, for scalability and some flexibility in ISA. Um, so you have to, you know, be mindful of how you set up your networks there. When you get those closed proprietary ones, there's usually not a standard that's usually defined by the vendor that's developing it, and then you're locked in with that vendor. So. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, 
Another question that we've come in is, is asking whether the wireless detectors are compatible with legacy wired detectors. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, compatible with that would mean, but um, we do frequently will have uh, both wired and wireless detectors in, in the same plant. Um, you'll have your wire detectors might be a Modbus, a 420, or a, just a contact relay back to a controller, and that controller will be setting off alarms or notifying operators or something along those lines. Similarly, a wireless one would be through a gateway, and that gateway will typically communicate Modbus or OPC server back to the operators, the same sort of information. Um, so it's just a case of how it gets to the operator. Uh, so they're frequently op uh, used in the same exact facility. Uh, you can't take one out and just plug it right back in because there's, there's no wires to connect. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, another question that we've come in is asking specifically about um, maintenance of the devices. So can, can you talk to us a little bit about that? How, how is that achieved? Sure, you want me to take that one, Chris? Yeah. Um, so um, there's, a, there's a number of things. I mean, we built the device specifically with maintenance in, in mind. Uh, that was one of the, the defining characteristics of it. So just about everything that we do with our product, you do with one hand. Um, the sensors are easily popped out and other ones can be popped back in. The battery gets removed uh, pretty easily from the back um, and can be done in a hazardous location. It's intrinsically safe. Uh, so it's hot swappable and then there's one button on the side that does all of the the you know, call it, i don't want to call it programming but um steps you through menus when you have to uh, bump test or calibrate the product uh, so it's it's pretty simple to set up um, typically when you put one of these things in the field it takes about 10 minutes or so to for it to, to link into the network and and start talking it takes about five minutes to configure it um, if you want to change the, the configuration in the product. So it's pretty pretty straightforward, um, pretty easy to do. Um, and then ongoing, it, it, you treat it like you would a wired gas detector in the sense that it should, if you have a standard in the plant for calibrating these or for bump testing them, you'd follow the same standard with, with, a, with a wireless device. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Thanks for that, Ken. Um, so another question that's come in is asking, how much is the average price of a wireless point and how many are recommended per a given surface? Hmm. For a given service? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'll take the, um, and kind of, you could jump in at any moment, but when you when you map out your plant or your facility, there's a, there's a variety of ways to approach it. Um, if it's a small facility, you want to monitor, say, one valve or something. You try to, uh, you know, you could buy one detector and um, measure downstream of a pre predominant wind direction. But if you have multiple directions, you might want to have two detectors on either side. Um, there's different approaches. You could do gas mapping. You could do, um, which are services provided by other companies. Um, you can combine it with other detectors. So it really is going to be highly dependent on the geography uh as well as you know the facilities itself uh for tanks we've frequently seen folks will actually put it at the at four corners around a tank because a tank could have wind coming from either direction it's usually out in a more open space um and then for for some facilities they'll actually want to put a detector uh pretty tight you know every eight to fifteen feet um in, in places where they're really concerned about a leak and, and preventing an explosion because you don't want enough gas building up where you can have a damaging explosion, explosive event uh, where the inertia builds up and whatnot. So there's a variety of different ways. In terms of the uh, pricing, there's a, there's a great tool on our website at UE Online that provides you know a cost estimate where you can compare um, buying the detectors of a wired versus wireless and then figuring in all the trenching costs and wiring costs gateways versus um you know 420 inputs on a, a dcs uh to show you the full capital expenditures but the wireless detectors always tend to be a little bit more costly at a one-to-one -one gas detector um you know two three x uh but when you add up all the costs associated with install installing the wireless uh those costs tend to be 
um, a non-issue and, and, and there's a significant more cost on the permitting and trenching side. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, so uh, another question that's come in, um, it actually ties into something that I, I was going to ask you. Um, that we're being asked if there are any environmental conditions that may affect the detector performance. So I was wondering about that when it comes to things like the weather, as simple as that, um, what kind of impact that they may have. Sure. Ken, do you want to take that one or do you want? Sure. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, typically, um, weather is not a not a factor in these things. Uh, rain and, and um, snow, as long as you don't bury the thing in the snow, um, it uh, it'll do just fine. It, the signal goes right through. Um, the only thing that really uh, affects uh, the signal is uh, actually the biggest thing is trees. You put some evergreens in between the, the transmitter and a receiver and and the leaves on the trees damp it right down. So you have to wor worry about that a little bit. And we've heard stories about some of the wireless uh, trees grow up and all of a sudden your signals start to go away and don't know why. And uh, so you gotta get the landscapers out there. So, um, but weather, sandstorms even, uh, that shouldn't have a major impact on it uh, because the signal goes right through that kind of stuff. So it shouldn't be, shouldn't be an issue in most cases. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, so, so another question that's come in, and this is um, a popular question, um, is asking about data security, really. So uh, how can you ensure data security with wireless data? Yeah, so so this is where the standard is, is very helpful. Um, basically, the standard has its own uh, um, uh, layers of security in the standard. Uh, and ways that the radios communicate with the gateways. Um, and a lot of those are, are kind of off the shelf components that, that help layer that in. But uh, there's a couple of other things that the gateway allows. You can do blacklisting or whitelisting. Um, uh, the, ni the nice thing about whitelisting, um, you know, you specify exactly which devices you're gonna allow on. Those devices can't log on until you program in the, the security code it's sort of like a you know uh, uh, SSID and a password. This would have a uh, network ID and there's a key, which is is uh, four numbers that you have to program into it. Um, so as long as you have those two, it, it, there's a good handshake to make sure that the um, the device was allowed on the network in the first place. So we've actually over the last couple of years seen a lot more customers shifting towards um, whitelisting as opposed to the old methodology. Um, you can black um, Blank out channels so you can specify exactly what channels are being used. Uh, so there's a variety of things within that standard that help uh, drive that cybersecurity. Yeah, I would just add, I mean, the, the signals are all encrypted. So they use AES-128, that uh, the same kind of standard that most governments use, I guess. So it's it's pretty robust security. Um, and and uh, the other advantage I think is that when customers are first looking at wireless, there is an understandable um, hesitancy, shall we say, um, to that, especially around the IT folks and security. And so the nice thing about this is, is that you can build a system up that's independent of your process control and your the rest of your, your, your systems and just keep it isolated. And while you're testing and while you're looking at the, the various uh, gas detectors out there in, in relation to what they're doing. And it's not tied into the overall system at all. So your IT people don't have to be concerned about there being a path in because it's completely air gap. So um, it's it's one of the things that's it's kind of nice about this is that they can build some confidence up and, and do their investigation without, without fear of that. Okay, brilliant. Thank you guys for um, providing a bit of reassurance on, on that one for us. Um, so the next question that we have um, is, is asking about, aside from complying with wireless standards, does this comply um, specifically with NFPA 72? Um, what about the supervision of the device's requirements for NFPA? Do you want to take that one? Or... Yeah, I'll, I'll try. Uh, um, you may want to jump in on this one a little bit, but um, uh, NFPA 72 is really built around fire safety, and a lot of the a lot of the system um, 
the language in it is around flame detection and um, things like that. Um, gas detection comes in in only a few sections of the standard at all, um, and it's fairly undefined in it. Um, it's, it's a, there's a lot of gray areas in it as far as gas detection goes too. Um, what what customers are doing, um, if you have to if you have to meet NFPA 72 specifically, then you're not only going to use hardwired gas detectors for that. Customers like that are using our type of device as an independent protection layer that sits below the fire and gas system and gives them kind of, I don't, wanna, I don't know whether you wanna call it finer control, like you can put these things around valves or around a compressor or something that you think might end up leaking and give yourself some advanced warning before the fire and gas system goes off and it calls the fire department and everybody starts running around. Um, it gives the operator a chance to kind of jump in and see if they can solve the problem before it becomes bigger. But that doesn't sit in NFPA 72. So um, there's there's definitely, you know, Chris mentioned in the, the webinar, those two standards. Um, one of them is has to do with wireless devices and the other one has to do with, with, with um, effectiveness of fire and gas systems. And you put the two of them together and you do build some a case for using wireless as a as a part of your system okay perfect thank you for that answer um a, a question that's come in here asking for a bit of advice really um if if you have a project how do you budget for the number of required gas detectors to account for unforeseen signal obstructions and redundant communication paths that's a good question it depends on um how early you're in a project, but my recommendation is you can engage us or, or your your desired vendor, <clears throat> excuse me, and we can help um, provide an estimate of the number of devices. Uh, basically, we would look at the, the layout of a plant um, and you would indicate where you'd want to monitor for gas and where you think a gateway would go. And we can advise if, if that would work or if you need to add repeaters or more gas detectors or or suggest a different location for the gateway itself just to try and minimize it. There's a number of things you can do to try and minimize the number of devices and repeaters that you have to put in. Yeah, I would say that there's basically three things you can do. One is, is gas mapping. If, if you're starting off from scratch and you want to um, want, to, want the best analysis possible. Um, there are a number of people that do um, specifically gas mapping and, and uh, the dynamics of that. Um, and that's kind of a, a first layer um, from our standpoint, from the wireless side of things. Um, you're, we usually work from like Google Maps or something like that. Um, just get, a, get an overhead view of, of the space so that we can do some distance estimating uh, and then maybe a site survey to, to walk through and see if there are things like obstructions that you can't quite see from above and um, changes in elevation and things like that. And you put those three things together and you've got a pretty good idea of what you're doing. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for those answers. Um, another, another question is asking, uh, can wireless detectors be used for quantitative estimation of the amount of gas that is being released? Uh, more so from the emission side, I'm assuming. Um, that that's that's tricky because now you have a point detector um, and you're trying to account for a large area uh, and potential uh, emissions and when you start increasing the amount of area that you're multiplying from one point um, you have to get a much more precise measurement at that point uh, typically what I've seen in the emissions is uh, a a gravitation more towards line of sight type detectors or satellite or um, drone or airplane based detection uh, where they'll use say a, a TDLAS or something along those lines get a much more precise measurement or, or an accurate measurement over long distances to, to make those estimates. Um, the flip side of that is those systems can or services can be very expensive so you don't do them continuously or uh, you do spot checking um, and there there's a latency there because you're collecting a lot of data to average over time so the trade-off is safety versus emissions on what you want. You want speed of response, so you know that you're gonna to get to a point where you, you need to take action to protect plant, uh, or do you need precision 
uh, so that you're not investing too much money um, in terms of plant upgrades to try to address an emissions that, that might really not be that big. Yeah. Anything about that, Ken? Or I guess the only thing I, I would add is that, that you know trying to work kind of a um, defense in depth so you can use fixed point detectors at places where you think the leaks might develop and then use that alarming capability to say, okay, now we need to go out, fly a drone over that particular site or send somebody out with a camera or yeah. something like that to, to try and get that quantification down. But, you know, as Chris said, you know, having people running around with cameras or fixing cameras all over the place gets really, really expensive and, and heavy on data usage. So um, the mixture, the mixture can be a really good way to do it. Okay, brilliant. Uh, so another question that's coming is asking about specifically what kind of gases and substances that they users can expect to detect as there's such a huge range. Can you can you provide a bit more information about that for us? Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to. We 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 look at um, LEL, so we're looking at hydrocarbons um, like propane or methane, um, or we can do some others as well. And then toxics like H2S or CO or ammonia or things like that um, are pretty much the common ones. And there are, you know, whatever, a hundred and well, there's hundreds of gases um, that you could possibly sense. But when you're thinking about wireless, it really comes down to probably half a dozen or a dozen gases that people want to be able to detect outside that they're worried about, and about 150 gases that a semiconductor plant would want to worry about. But that's enclosed and they've got a lot of wire and they're probably never going to use wireless so um, what we found is that uh, the, the handful of gases that we're looking at cover just about everything that we've run across so far because um, it's usually outdoors yeah and the, and the technologies we use are are very similar to wired so we have ndir for oels we use electrochemical for a lot of our toxics um, we're getting ready to introduce the hydrogen as well um, and so we add uh, as needed for customer projects depending on on what's required so if it's if it's a electrochemical or ndar chances are we'll be able to do it um, if you currently have to use a like a palister or cat B, those tend to be high energy uh, using a battery with high energy would really limit that that battery life yeah i guess the, the only thing i would, would add to that is that that um, we have gotten a large number of applications used where we're sensing things like gasoline um, yep. and some fuels. And as long as there's a fraction in there that's late that's gonna, gonna outgas, um, one of the LEL detectors will, will detect it. As I said in the presentation, I, you're, you're not gonna get a really accurate reading of it because it's got so many different components to it, but you will know if there's something there. So. That's the way customers are using that kind of thing in, in a tank farm or a fueling terminal. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, a very specific question here, but do, do you have approval for use in Germany? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, we have ATEX and IECEX certification. Yeah. For, yeah. Okay, perfect. That's good. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, okay, another question that's come in um, is asking whether your gas detectors um, can be connected to wireless heart gateways from other manufacturers, or do they need to be um, connected to um, United Electric Controls gateways only? Uh, the, we the, the beauty of wireless heart is that you can do any, you can use anybody. It's, it's anything that's wireless heart, by definition, needs to talk to each other, and so anybody's gateway, anybody's instrumentation. I mean, that's that's the, really the strength of wireless heart is you, know, you can have pressure instrumentation and level and corrosion monitors and vibration and our stuff, and it's all passing signals back and forth. So uh, yeah, we, we've we actually tested um, well on about uh, at least a half a dozen different gateways. Um, and we, we have a lab upstairs. So if there's a particular gateway you want us to test that we haven't got yet, uh, we, we we could test that and let you guys know, um, but we have about four or five different manufacturers up there in the lab. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So we're, we're coming towards the end now, but we still got time for for a couple more questions. So if you do have a question for Chris and Ken, now's your last chance to get it into us. Quick, quickly type it over to us, and we'll we'll try and get through it for the end. Um, 
how many wireless detectors can be connected in a to a single gateway? That's another question that we've had come in. Yeah, it's highly dependent on the, the manufacturer of the gateway. Um, we've seen some gateways that only allow 25 devices, some that allow 100, and uh, I think at most it's 250. Um, and that's a limit on, on, on the routers in the gateways themselves. Yeah, yeah. The other part of that is it, it depends on what kind of update rates you're using yeah. for the implementations coming in. If you're using a lot of a lot of fast um, update rates, then you have to derate the gateway pretty significantly. So um, it's really a combination of what the capacity of the gateway is and how much stuff you're trying to put through it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, a question that's coming is asking how you detect hydrogen because it's lighter than air. You put it above the leak. <laughs> uh, there's two ways. That I mean, it, it, you, you would probably put a cone over something to help direct the um, the hydrogen up. Uh, if it's a container, it's contained in the container. Uh, but yeah, you you would hide, you would mount your detector up higher um, above where you think a leak might be, and you'd potentially have a capture device if needed. Okay, perfect, great. Um, uh, we've also been asked if you have um, if you have a portable gas detection system. Um, you could take one of these transmitters and carry it around with you, I suppose, if you wanted to. But, uh, it would be all we would be able to do. You know, the, the advantage of, of wireless is it can be moved around, but it's not a not a portable in the same way that you would think of, like a wearable or something like that. Yeah, it's not a traditional area monitor. We do have some customers who use it because they can plug it right into their DCS and. They'll put it somewhere for six months to monitor an area, um, it, but it's not a traditional setup for like an area monitor or personal monitor in that sense. Okay, great, thank you. Um, a, a question that I have before we do wrap up is, I, I was just wondering what are some of the main challenges that your customers have faced when implementing a wireless gas detection network? Are you, are you able to talk to us about a few of those? Sure. Okay. The first thing that comes to mind is just, um, I would say, resistance to wireless. You know, there's, there's, um, I think, my experience is that, that wireless has been around for quite a while, and mostly in, in a proprietary sense. Um, and people tried wireless 10 or 15 years ago with one of those systems and had bad luck with it and said, oh, wireless is terrible. Um, we're not going to use that anymore here because look at look at what happened. So. Um, you have to kind of you have to overcome that mindset of of um, resistance to it. Um, I would say pulling together the instrumentation, the analyzer people, and the IT people, especially the IT people, um, into uh, into thinking wireless can be used is is another thing that uh, that, that customers have to deal with. Um, it's not it's not as simple that uh, you know the the question about um, you know, security always comes up, and it doesn't seem to come up very much with with a wired device. So, um, it's it's it is an issue, and it's something that it can be addressed. But but it definitely is is interesting. So um, that's I would say those are the two biggest things. Um, the other, the other thing that, that we have run into is um, customers if they don't build a good mesh. If they if they try to hang a lot of devices out and have one device coming in pulling all that data in, that tends to really cause problems. Uh, so that you get these choke points there. So you need to really think about the design of what you're trying to do, uh, and and make sure that you're you're building an effective system. So, which we can help with. Perfect, brilliant. Thank you, Ken. Um, so before before we wrap up, I just was wondering, Chris and Ken, if, if there was anything that you wanted to add, um, any concluding remarks for us today? Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't. We covered a lot of ground, um, so I do I do appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody here, and, and please don't hesitate to reach out with any other questions that may come up after after this webinar, after this event, um, and uh, we'd be happy to work with. You. Yeah, and I would, would encourage people to go to the website because um, there are a lot of case studies. A couple of the ones I spoke about, I think, are on there, um, but there's a lot more. And as Chris said, there are tools for estimation and things that, that might help you uh, look, at, look at the idea anyway. So um, check that out and give us a call. We, we'd love to chat with people. So.
Perfect. Great. Thank you both. Um, so apologies if we didn't get round to your question this time. We did have a lot come in. Um, but if you, we're going to send all questions that we had over to Chris and Ken, and I'm sure they'll be happy to get back to you if we haven't if we haven't gone through yours. Um, and if you do have any further questions for, for Chris and Ken, um, their contact details are on the screen now, so you can reach out to them directly. Um, and before we finish, a final reminder that everyone who signed up to attend this webinar will receive a copy of the presentation via email shortly. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this Q&A, we're going to be sharing a quick survey after this webinar has finished. Uh, it should only take a few minutes to complete and your thoughts will be really valuable to the team at United Electric Controls. So please do look out for this survey at the end. It will pop up on your screen um, and just take a few minutes to answer those questions for us. Um, and finally, before we, before we finish, I'd just like to point everyone in the direction of the autumn issue of Tanks and Terminals magazine, which will be coming out any day now. Um, it's going to include an article from Chris and his colleague Julian Yeo, um, which is a follow-up on a piece that they wrote for us in the summer issue of Tanks and Terminals, and it's going to outline re recommended practices to help users implement wireless gas detection systems in industrial facilities and it also talks about deployment considerations. Um, so as I mentioned, this issue is coming out um, in the next couple of days. So if, if you're not already a subscriber, please head over to our website, www.tanksterminals.com and click on the magazine tab to sign up for a free subscription. So thanks again, Chris and Ken, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Carl.